this opportunity to say happy Father's Day to all of the fathers. Happy Father's Day to all. Can all the fathers please stand? I mean, come on, it's your day. 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 Happy Father's Day to all of the fathers. Amen. Happy Father's Day, Pastor Kane. Happy Father's Day, Elder Marshall. Happy Father's Day, all of the fathers. Amen. We honor you. Amen. I am a woman that believes in fathers. Amen. We're not supposed to do this thing alone. You can be seated. God bless you. Uh, I'm just talking to you right now. We're not supposed to do this thing alone. Amen. When we have to, God gives us grace. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I was a single parent for 12 years before I got married. But boy, it's good to have a father in the house. Amen. And I can relate to both sides of the world. I can relate to not having a father in the house. And so I understand that for some people, this day is a day that is different for us. I understand that. And I want to encourage those of us who are on the other side of it. God is your father. He is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Ah, ah, I love the word of God. He said he will defend, not just love you, but he will defend you. Hallelujah. And so he is active in his love for the fatherless. I've been on that side of it, raised a, a young boy who grew up without really knowing his father. So I know the pain of it. And I've been on the other side of it, been married and seen children grow up with their father. Amen. And so I understand both sides of it. And I honor fathers. It's not an easy job. When you do it right, it's not an easy job. Oh. I said, when you do it right, it's not an easy job. And some of us don't have a context for that. We don't have a frame of reference for seeing a man do it right. And so when we have men who are trying to serve God, trying to live right, trying to do right, we ought to appreciate them. Y'all don't hear me, though. I say, y'all don't hear me, though. I say, when you find a man that's trying to serve God, trying to do right, at least trying to be a father, you ought to appreciate it. Because mm? some of us, our testimony about our fathers is in the words of that great song, Papa was a rolling stone. Some of us, that's all we know about Papa. Papa rolled in, he rolled out, hung his hat up, got up the next morning, and he was out. But we ought to take time to appreciate our men who are trying to live for God. Oh, can you clap your hands for real, for real? <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, I want to appreciate my husband, Pastor Cephas Reese, for all that he does for our children. Oh, that clapping, that clapping is on life support and it's falling down. I say, I want to appreciate my husband, Pastor Cephas Reese, for all he does for our children. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. It's a blessing. So fathers, we appreciate you and we honor you. We know that it's not an easy job. The heart of the father is to give. For God so loved the world that he did what he gave. And the heart of the father is to nurture. And the heart of the father is to discipline. Come on now. Uh, the other day I was in the house and I had to do some disciplining. And uh, I was using my belt. And the Holy Ghost said, mm-mm, switch. So I said, Sunita, go look in this particular closet and see if your daddy still has a belt in that closet. The Holy Ghost said, you need a different belt. So I used Pastor Reed's belt. Oh, y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all don't use belts on your children. Okay. Keep on. Keep on. The Bible said, beat them, they will not die. The Bible said, the rod of correction will drive our foolishness from the child. Y'all keep on looking at me like I'm crazy. Okay. Mm. All right. So the Holy Ghost said, you need a different belt. So I switched the belt. And I used Pastor Reed's belt and I got a different result. Mm, Y'all don't hear me though. Hello. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, glory to God. Amen. And so uh, we just appreciate fathers. Amen. Hallelujah. Go on and clap your hands for the fathers. Amen. And those of you that are in that stage of life where you are seeking 
a wife, and believe in God to be a potential father, I want to say to you, work on your character. Work on yourself. Because children are watching you, even when you don't think they are watching you. Mm. They're watching you. Amen? But God will give you the grace. Amen? All right. Let's pray before we go into the word of God. We're continuing our series on commission possible. And I want to talk to you this morning and continue with part two of our co-mission is a compassion mission. Somebody say that with me. Our co-mission is a compassion mission. Our co-mission is a compassion mission mission. Somebody pray with me as we prepare to go into the word. Father, we thank you. We give you all of the honor. We give you all the glory. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for being the head of the church. Right now, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we take authority over any distraction. This is the time for your word. And Father, you said that the entrance of your word, it gives light. It brings light and it gives understanding. And so, Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we plead the blood over this atmosphere. We activate the speaking of the blood over this atmosphere. We activate the ministry of your holy angels over this atmosphere. And we declare that the enemy will not snatch our understanding. But let your word enter and let our hearts be good ground to receive your word. Give us an ear to hear what you are saying by your spirit to the church. And we'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the honor, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen. I feel good this morning, and it's so good to see all your beautiful faces. Uh, I want to ask you to please stand with me, uh, and then you'll be able to sit down for the duration of the message. But just for a minute, can you stand with me and preach with me and Stand with me. Amen. I want us to stand for the reading of God's word. And we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 13. Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 13. And I'm reading from the King James. Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 13. And I'm reading from the King James. And it reads, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. So this is a private lesson saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So their question to Jesus privately is how are we going to know when you are coming back and how are we going to know when the end of the world is coming? Verse four, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of of wars see that you be not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet verse 7 for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places in many places and all these are the beginning of sorrows then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. What a word. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. These are signs of the end times. And many false prophets shall arise. So we should expect that there are false prophets. And shall deceive many. Verse 12, and listen to this, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You can be seated in his presence. In our opening text, the disciples come to Jesus privately, and they asked him what will be the sign of the end of the world and the sign of his return. So we understand that this is a private lesson. Are you with me? So I want you to picture the, the disciples coming to him privately. They are bewildered. They have a question. They don't know. 
And they say, we know we better go ask him. So they go behind closed doors privately and they ask Jesus, all this thing you're talking about, you're going to tear down the temple and restore it in three days and the end of the world is going to come. All this stuff you're talking about, we don't understand it. We don't understand. We don't understand. So please tell us, what is the sign that we should be looking for that you are on your way back and that it is the end of the world? Somebody say, what's the sign? So Jesus begins to talk to them privately, amen? And he says that one of the signs and one of the ways that you will know that you are in the end times, that you are in the last of the last days, the end times that I'm about to come back is that many people will be offended. Many people will be offended. Not only that, many people will hate one another. And many people will do what? Betray one another. And so I submit to you that we have a way of knowing that we are in the end times. Does anybody remember in the book of Acts that when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, it was like fire sitting on their heads. Anybody remember that Peter stood up? And said, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but this is the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken in the book of Joel. That in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And so if the disciples 2,000 years ago experienced a fulfillment of something that was supposed to happen in what is called the last days, what day are we in? And I submit to you that we are not in the last days. I submit to you that we are in the end times. Is anybody hearing me this morning? And Jesus said one of the things that's going to happen in the end times, don't be ignorant, don't be surprised. One of the things that's going to happen in the end times is that many people will be offended. And they will hate one another. And they will betray one another. Now many of us don't have to look far to see that that is a reality. Many of us can look right in our family and see betrayal and see offense and see hatred. Is anybody here this morning? And so what I'm trying to get us to understand is that we are living on borrowed time. Now, I know everybody says grandma said Jesus was coming back. Great grandma said Jesus was coming back. Everybody said, everybody, everybody said Jesus was coming back. He ain't come back yet. But listen, let me tell you, no day is promised to you. And we are in, if we look at what Jesus said, it is very clear that we are in the end times. Somebody say Amen. Ah, we are in the end times. And even as believers, we have to be aware that society is influencing us to be desensitized. One of the things that Jesus also said is that the love of many will wax cold. Now, if you look around the society, you see that the society is making people desensitized. It's causing people to wax cold. We see so much violence. Not even on TV anymore, on the internet, on the YouTube. We see so much violence on Facebook, social media. People post all kind of stupid stuff. And we see it all day long and we become desensitized. Is anybody with me? So Jesus said that the love of many will wax cold. And these days I'm asking God to, de to, to, to sensitize me. I'm asking God to show me where my love has waxed cold. Is anybody here? And I want to put something before you this morning. I want everybody, all of us included, to ask ourselves this question. Has my love waxed cold? I want all of us to ask ourselves this question. You see, because it's easy to love those who are in your squad. It's easy to love those who are in your crew. It's easy to love those that roll with you, us four and no more. It's easy for you to love your unit. But when it comes to loving somebody who is on their way to hell, I want us to ask ourselves, has our love waxed cold? All of us have to do what I call self introspection or self-reflection or self-evaluation and this morning I'm putting a question to you has your love waxed cold why must we ask ourselves this question if our co-mission is a compassion mission and our love has waxed cold we will not be effective in the mission and that is why it is imperative for each and every one of us to ask ourselves this question. Has my love, not for my squad, 
But for those outside my squad, has my love waxed cold? Research about something called the bystander effect, which saying that for most adults and even for children, it has. And I want us to cue the video for those on the AV team, please, those behind the sound, I want us to cue the video. Research about something called the bystander effect, which saying that for most adults and even for children, our love has waxed cold. Let me explain to you what the bystander effect is. When people are asked whether they would spontaneously assist a person in an emergency situation, almost everyone will reply positively, yes, I would help. So if somebody asks you, if you see somebody falling down dying on the sidewalk or in the grocery store at the gas station, will you help them? Almost everybody says yes, right? Everybody will say yes, okay? All right? Although we all imagine ourselves as heroes, the fact is that many people refrain from helping in real life, especially when we are aware that other people are present at the scene. In the late 1960s, are you still with me? In the late 1960s, uh, an extensive research program was initiated on so-called the bystander effect. In their article, they find that any person who was the sole bystander helped. So if you're there by yourself and nobody else is around, you'll help the person. That's what they found. They found that any person who was the sole bystander helped, but only 62% of the participants intervened when they were part of a larger group of five bystanders. Following these first findings, many researchers consistently observed a reduction in helping behavior in the presence of others. This pattern is observed during serious accidents, non-critical situations, on the internet, and even in children. Did you hear that? Even in children. Now, we say, okay, that's fine and good, but me, I'm going to help somebody. You know, I'm going to try to help somebody. Now, we are asking ourselves how or if our love has waxed cold. So I want to show you some real life examples to consider in your evaluation. As you ask yourself the question, have my love waxed cold, I want to show you some real life examples. Is that okay? Yeah, I want to show you some real life examples to consider in your self-evaluation. We're going to watch three videos from three different countries. And I want you to consider them in your evaluation. Are we ready? Okay, let's cue the first video. Stay with me. I'm still preaching. This is still preaching. I want you to watch the video. Stay with me. Okay, we need the sound, and then let's start it over. Okay, while they're working on it, let me read something to you. I need us to be ready. Let me read this to you. Stabbed hero dies as more than 20 people stroll past him. A heroic homeless man stabbed after saving a queen's woman from a knife-wielding attacker lay dying in a pool of blood for more than nearly uh, an hour as nearly 25 people indifferently strolled past him. So he helped a woman who was being stabbed. And he got knife in the process, and he laid down on the sidewalk, and nobody helped him. Y'all let me know when y'all ready with the sound. Please work on it. And he lay down there for nearly an hour after 25 people indifferently strolled past him. A shocking surveillance video obtained by the Post revealed this. Some of the passersby paused to stare at Hugo Alfredo uh, la uh, last Sunday morning, and others leaned down to look at his face, but they walked by. Please hurry up. They leaned down to look at his face, but they walked by. He had jumped to the aid of a woman attacked on a 144th Street at 88th Road in Jamaica at 5.40 a.m., was stabbed several times in the chest, and collapsed as he chased his assailant. In the wake of the bloodshed, a man came out of a nearby building and chillingly took a cell phone photo of the victim 
before leaving. Can you imagine? You, the man is laying down dying. And you take a picture with your cell phone. And you don't help him. This is the state that we are living in. We are talking about the end times. And Jesus said the love of many will do what? Wax cold. Are we ready with the video? Okay, let's go. Stops as his front wheel comes in contact with his body, then accelerates over the body into the parking spot. It was at that moment the woman reappeared and starts yelling that the driver has killed the old man. The unnamed 54-year-old died at hospital from crush injuries. When interviewed by police, the driver of the car claimed he hadn't noticed running over anything. Come on, he didn't even try to claim he thought it was a speed bump? Tomonews.net. Okay, let's go to the second video. Okay, so this is China. That was China that we just watched, okay? Let's go to the second video. The second video, I think, is either from the U.S. or it's from France. He's saying, help me. Help me. So this is France, and he's saying, help me. Help me. So this is France. Let's go to the, the last video. Let's go to the last video. So we looked at China. We looked at France. Let's look at the last one. I think the last one is here in the United States. After somebody carjacked him and other people just walked right by. It was caught on gas station surveillance video in Detroit. Watch this. The suspect knocks Aaron Brantley down, and that broke his leg. And then people go right by him, right by him, as he crawled inside for help. What is wrong? I was wondering why they was passing me if they saw me crawling. They knew something was wrong. They should have. But people don't want to get involved in anything now, you know what they you were always raised to help other people. It's sickening, it's disgusting, it's sad. They treated him like he was a dog. That is so disheartening. Brantley says that someone did eventually help him and drove him home. Thank you so much. Clap for our AV team, clap for them, amen. They are under pressure. <laughs> but these are real life examples. We are asking ourselves the question, has our love waxed cold? And so I wanted you to see these real life examples because everybody says, oh, I will help somebody until they actually get into the situation. So we saw three videos. We saw a video from China where the man lay in the street and somebody drove on top of him and then tried to say, well, I didn't realize that I had 
rolled over anything. We saw a video next from France where the man is lying in the street saying, help me, help me. And people walk by. Did y'all see grandma? Grandma walked and looked at him and kept on moving. And then we watched the third video here in the United States where an elderly man is carjacked, pushed to the floor and broke his leg, crawled into the gas station. And on his way crawling, nobody helped him. The Bible said, Jesus said, that in the end times, the love of many will do what? Wax cold. My presupposition to you was this. If our compassion waxes cold, or if our love waxes cold, we will not be effective in our commission. Because our commission is a compassion mission. And if we wax cold in our love for people outside our squad, we will not be effective in our commission. This is real life. And Jesus gave us his own example thousands of years ago in the book of life of what we just saw. Do you want to see what Jesus said about the bystander effect? Let's look at Luke chapter 10 and verse number 30. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 30. I'm reading from the King James and it says, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. He was carjacked at the gas station which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that day. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Are you with me? The priest, the pastor, the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, teacher, and great evangelist saw the man, looked at him like grandma did on the video. And went to the other side of the street. Verse 32. And likewise a Levite when he was at the place came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now who's the Levite? The Levite is the praise and worship leader. So the praise and worship leader <laughs> saw the man. Looked. Took a photo with his cell phone. And kept on walking. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him, he had what? He had what? He had what? I want to submit to you this morning that compassion is the key. I want to submit to you this morning that the pastor, the apostle, the great evangelist, prophet, teacher, Saw this man who had fell among thieves, bleeding out the side of his head on the road, carjacked, broken leg, can't walk, need help. And the great prophet and apostle passed to the other side of the road. And then the praise and worship leader came out of the presence of God. Hey, hallelujah, glory, ha, shantaka. To the other side of the road. But the Bible said a Samaritan, a half breed. Samaritans were not respected, Samaritans were half breeds, and the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Huh? But the Samaritan, the half breed, the one that nobody expected, the one that everybody looked down on, he was the one that had compassion. I came to tell somebody, God ain't concerned about your title. God is not concerned about your title. God is not concerned about how beautiful you can sing. He is looking for some people that have compassion. And even if he has to use a half-breed Samaritan that everybody looks down on, he will use that person to start a wave of revival. I came to tell somebody revival ain't coming from behind the pulpit. Revival is coming from you having compassion on the lost, from you having compassion on somebody who looks like they are not worth anything, but God can start still move your heart with compassion to preach the gospel to them and to help them. The priest went to the other side of the road. This is Jesus talking over 2,000 years ago. 
before psychologists came up with a term called the bystander effect. And so if we look past all of the, the terms of the psychologists, what the problem is, is we have a love problem. We have a compassion problem. Don't come give me heavy, heavy terms with your psychology. Jesus already told us over 2,000 years ago, the problem is in the end times, people's love will wax cold. In other words, their compassion will go cold. Compassion includes the word passion, and passion means heat. So the opposite of compassion is your love growing cold. Y'all mighty quiet. But the Samaritan, verse 33, but the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him, and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, money, 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 and gave them to the host, and said unto him, take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Who would have thought that the Samaritan would have the money? Who would have thought that the Samaritan would have the means? But listen, let me tell you, even if you spend your last on helping somebody, hmm, God will make sure that you are repaid. I said God will make sure that you are what? Repaid. When you give to the poor, the Bible says you lend to the Lord. And God always settles his accounts. Somebody say amen. Verse 36 which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. In other words, he that had compassion. He that showed compassion. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do likewise. Look at somebody say, go and do likewise. <laughs> Look at somebody say, go and do likewise. God could care less about our titles. He don't care whether you're a priest. He don't care whether you're a praise and worship leader. He's looking for somebody that has compassion. In this day and age, one of the greatest jobs of the believer is to not let your love wax cold. Because if we're not careful, even when we come into church, our love will wax cold for one another. Oh, that's why we started with, one, the commission begins where? At home. That's when we started this series. We started with the commission begins at home. Because we got to make sure that even our love for one another is not waxing cold. Because we can slide in the church. Hey, hallelujah, get a word. And slide out of the church. And we have relationship with nobody. And the Bible says that he who isolates himself seeks his own agenda. And we got a church. Now, I'm not talking about just one congregation. I'm talking about the state of the body of Christ. We got a church, the state of the body of Christ, where everybody is seeking their own. And so we have no connection, no relationship, and we go home just as lonely and just as sad and depressed as before we came to church because we don't relate to anybody. God designed us to be connected to people. You see, and everybody now wants a breakthrough, my breakthrough, my prophetic word. So we come to church just for our breakthrough and our prophetic word. And we leave lonely, disgusted, down in the dumps, crying. We are crazy, schizophrenic. We don't know what's wrong with us. In one minute, we are shouting hallelujah. The next minute, we are in tears, depressed. Because you ain't got no friends. You ain't got no friends. And let me give you a newsflash. The pastor cannot be everybody's friend. I cannot be your intimate friend. I cannot be an intimate friend to everybody in this church. I'm your shepherd. I'm your covering. I watch for your soul. I pray for you. But I can't be everybody's intimate friend. So the, God designed it that the body would have relationship with one another. Not just the pastor. Oh, y'all don't want to hear me though. Well, pastor, you know, I just, I just do better by myself. No, you don't. I said, no, you don't. Because we were all designed for a certain level of relationship. Everybody needs somebody. You may be built and wired that you don't need as many, but everybody needs somebody. So stop deceiving yourself. All I need is Jesus. Jesus, you're all I need. You're all. Uh. Yeah, when it comes to spiritual things, that might be true. But you ain't in the spirit 24-7. Oh.
I know you want to impress me, but everybody in the spirit 24-7. I am not in the spirit 24-7. I get annoyed. I get frustrated. My children get on my nerves. I am not in the spirit 24-7. So nobody is in the spirit 24-7. We ain't got to try to pretend. I ain't a pretender. I was sitting there talking to Marquita yesterday. And it came out, and I said, I done told you I don't have a poker face. I see what she was laughing at me. I don't have a poker face. I don't. I'm not a pretender. I don't like people who pretend. So don't sit and try to pretend like you're in the spirit all the time. You got a funky attitude sometime. You get annoyed sometime. You get pissed off sometime. And so do I. You are not in the spirit 24-7. You need relationships sometimes. You need somebody just to kick it with. You need somebody that you, ain't, you can just be yourself with. Can I get real with you? You need somebody you can pass gas in front of. Oh, look at your faces. Look at your faces. Look at your church face. That religious devil, I cast you out of here. You know you pass gas. Look at your faces. Don't sit up in church and act like, well, <laughs> Pastor, I don't do that. Really? You're the only human being on planet Earth that don't do that. Please. I beg you. Listen, folks. You need those kind of people around you. You need some relationship. You need somebody you can go to dinner with after church. Go to IHOP and get you some pancakes. Go wherever you want to go. I don't care. I don't know. But you need some people you can hang out with. Hallelujah. That's why some of us is creeping on the side. We creeping. We creeping back to Tyrone on the side because we ain't got no Christian friends. Oh, y'all don't hear me though. I know you never do it. I know you never do it. I'm not, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to y'all because I know with your face sitting there looking like an angel, you never do it. Okay. I haven't been saved my whole life. I didn't come out of the womb saved. I was a single parent. I know what them nice is like. <laughs> you look at the phone. <laughs> Jesus. You walk away from the phone. You walk back to the phone. And you're looking at it as if you didn't see that text before. You're looking at it like it's brand new. It ain't brand new. And you put the phone down. And you say, help me, Jesus, 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 Jesus. You walk back to the phone. And you say, well, I'm just going to call. I mean, ain't nothing wrong. We're just going to talk. I mean, ain't nothing. We're just going to talk. I mean, ain't nothing wrong with talking. And you have put yourself in a trap. I said a trap. Not a trap. A trap. You have put yourself in a trap. That's why you need some people you can hang out with. And you can say, look, um, sister girl, come get me. <laughs> come get me, sister girl. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Come and get me, brother man. Because if y'all don't come get me, oh, Lord, I'm going to lose my testimony. Yeah, but you don't need nobody. But you don't need nobody. Because you always in the spirit. The devil is a liar. And so is his mother-in-law. You need somebody. Listen. You need somebody. Let's stop acting like we don't need nobody. Hmm? That's why we said the commission starts at home. We got to make sure we got love one for another. Hallelujah. He said, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Compassion was Jesus' motivating driver. He told them the story so they could see that. Listen, it's not about your title. The priest didn't have it. The Levite didn't have it. It was a Samaritan who showed compassion. So Jesus was trying to get them to understand. Listen, listen, listen. Can I, can I trying to get them to understand? You, you, want, you want to identify with me. He's talking to the disciples now. This is a private lesson, right? We established that it's a private lesson. So all the disciples, they was rolling with Jesus. 
they were in his squad. And so Jesus was letting them know, look, don't glory in the fact that you're rolling with me. Everybody won't be in with the pastor. Oh. He was telling them, don't boast in the fact that you're running with me or you're rolling with me. I want to see your compassion. I want to see you win somebody to the loss. That's what he was telling them. This was a private lesson, remember? So he was hitting the disciples in their face so they would get it. Stop it. Do not boast in the fact that the demons tremble at you. You are boasting in the wrong thing. Let me see your compassion. Let me see you win a soul. How many years have you been born again? 19 years. You've been born again since the days of Methuselah. Where your soul at? Who have you won to Christ? So Jesus was trying to get them to see, look, <laughs> y'all got it twisted. Let's fix it. It's a compassion thing. Amen? Compassion was Jesus' motivating driver. Compassion was what he spoke about in the context of the commission. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Compassion was what he talked about in the context of the commission. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. I'm reading from the King James. Are you still with me this morning? Hallelujah. Let's continue the journey. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all. Somebody say all. So, let me help us understand. Anybody seen on a preacher's website their itinerary? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Where you go on, you see everywhere that preacher is going to be. Sometimes they're in Texas, sometimes they're in Maryland. So the scripture said Jesus went to how many cities? So Jesus' itinerary was loaded. Are you with me? Do you see this? Look at Jesus' webpage. Scroll. Keep on scrolling. Keep on scrolling. Oh, we tired of scrolling, Jesus. I got to go to every city. Keep on scrolling. He went to all the cities. Do you see that? Jesus' itinerary was what? It was packed. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages. Oh, oh, all the cities and the what? So Jesus didn't say, well, you know, if your church ain't 5,000, I ain't coming. Even the villages, not the cities. Can I help you understand? The city and the village is the city and the country. Or the city and the bush. So Jesus didn't only go to the city. He went to the bush too. He went to the country. He went down to Aiken. South Carolina. He went down to Mississippi. He went down to the country. Okay. He went to the cities and the villages. All of them. Somebody say all of them. He went about all the cities and villages doing what? Teaching in their synagogues, their churches. And preaching what? The gospel. Preaching what? The gospel. Preaching what? The gospel. Not motivational speaking. The gospel. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom and doing what? Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But something changed. Something happened. Something happened. Something happened. As he went about his itinerary into all the cities and all the other villages, something happened. When he saw the multitudes, this is what happened. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no what? Shepherd. What was the result? Then saith he unto his disciples. This was the result. Then saith he unto his disciples. The harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Is this not the year of the harvest in Action Chapel International worldwide? Is this not the year of the harvest? Now, why did Jesus tell them the harvest is plenteous but the laborers are few? Why, what led him to say that? How are these two things connected? How is Jesus' itinerary being full and packed and him going to all the cities, how is that connected to him making the statement that the harvest is plenteous and the labors are few? Something happened. 
as he went to all those cities and all those villages and all those towns and all the country, Bone County and Carisburg and Bogotonga and all the places and down south Mississippi, something happened. Can I submit to you, Jesus got tired? You the only one healing. What was he doing? Preaching the gospel. Healing their sick. Casting out devils. You got a never-ending itinerary. And you look up and you say, man, the harvest is plenty. <laughs> but the laborers is few. I'm tired. I need some more laborers. <laughs> the man was tired. He said, the harvest is plenteous. I'm out here in all these cities, Chicago, over, uh, 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 over to New York, uh, uh, down to Jersey, Connecticut, uh, 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 Philadelphia, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, uh, D.C., uh, Virginia, uh, North Carolina. I'm all over here preaching, casting out devils, healing. And I look up and say, man, the harvest is plenteous, but the labor is a few. He came to a realization that I need some more laborers up in here. This itinerary <laughs> is a challenge. I need some more laborers. Listen, God expects you and me to be laborers. Are you still in this church? Are you still here? I know your body is here, but are you here? God expects us to be what? Laborers. He was moved with what? Compassion. This is the context of our commission. Jesus moved with compassion. Full itinerary. Tired and looking around and saying, we need some more laborers. The harvest is what? Plenteous. But the laborers are what? Few. Are you still here? <laughs> are you still here? Look at somebody next to you and say, wake up. Are you here? Are you here? Are you here? Are you here? Wake him up. Wake him up. Wake him up. Compassion is what moved Jesus even when he was tired. Are you with me? Compassion is, listen, where are my parents at? Where are my parents at? Where are my parents at? Don't you get tired with your children? What moves you to move for them even when you are tired? When, listen, let me give you an example that I just went through recently. You know your children, Right? You know your children. You say, did you do your homework? Yes. Come here, let me check it. Okay. Is there anything else going on at school? No. That's the night before school, right? They come home from school and they say, uh, Mama, I need uh, supplies for a project tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow? Why you ain't said nothing before today? I forgot. And the spirit of slap comes on you. But you shake it off because that's your child. And you got compassion for them and you want them to do well in school, right? So what causes you to move for your children even when they get on your nerves? It's your compassion for them. It's your love for them. It's your care for them. And I'm telling you that that same compassion was Jesus' driving force and his motivating force to keep preaching from city to city and from town to town. He was moved to action by compassion. If you're going to clap, clap well. <laughs> compassion is not compassion. Listen to this. Compassion is not compassion until it makes you do something. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to say it again for free. Compassion is not compassion until it makes you do something. How many homeless people do we drive by? And we say, get a job. And we keep it moving. Compassion is not compassion until it makes you do something. And I know, I've been there. For me, when I see them uh, hustling on the side of the street corners with their signs, and I see a man, sometimes you see our Caucasian brothers, and they got muscles. I'm like, man, what? I should give you my money. Go and do a day job. Lift some boxes for one day. They will pay you. And sometimes I'm like, dude, I ain't, I ain't finna give you my money. Dude, for real? No. But God said, 
we should be moved to do something. So even sometimes now, what, sometimes I don't give no money. I stop and I talk to them, and I find out, are you on something? Are you high? What you doing? What you going to do with my money? You going to go buy some alcohol? You going to buy some liquor? Because I ain't finna give you my money for no drugs. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, I ain't smoking. I ain't smoking. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Cool. I just want to find out. I just want to know. You see, it ought to move you to do something. Even if you don't want to give them your money, talk to them. Find out what is going on with them. Talk to them and let them know, look, I want to help you, but I ain't finna get my money if you're going to get high. Talk to them. And sometimes I want to give them money, but I ain't got nothing. So I stop and I say, look, this is all I got. Will it insult you if I give you change? No, I'll take it. Fine, here you go. This is what I got. Talk to them. They are people. They are human beings. They are people just like you. I'm scared. Well, you know, this is Baltimore. I got to keep my window rolled up and my door locked. For real. For real. I thought God had not given us a spirit of fear. I ain't telling you open the door and tell them to come sit in your car. That ain't what I said. I said stop and talk to them. Stop. Roll your window down. Talk to them. And you will find that some of them are very intelligent people. Very intelligent people. With degrees more than you. What happened to them is what we started the series with. Isolation. They got into trouble and they didn't have nobody to help them. No family, all their family relationships broken. So by the time they got in trouble, they couldn't call nobody. So their pride made them say, I'll just, I'll just, I'm going to make it myself. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. You think you don't need nobody? Go and talk to a homeless person. Go and talk to a homeless person. Me and Sydney, I stopped the other day, and I asked her, you know, I was talking to her, and I said, you know, we're trying to get our food bank started. Do you think we should take it to the motel? She said, no, we down Patapsco under the bridge. Caucasian woman, old, older woman, standing there with her son. And I stopped to talk to her. She said, I know, I know they go to the motel, but I don't use my money for that. I'm down under the bridge, uh, under, uh, 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 down Patapsco. And she said, there's a group of us under the bridge. And she said, if you bring me the flyers, once you get your food bank started, I'll make sure they get them down under the bridge. I said, thank you. Just a conversation. Just a conversation. Compassion is what moved Jesus even when he was tired with a full itinerary. Even when it looked like his disciples weren't catching it and he was the only one that was on mission. Compassion for the lost was what compelled him to keep going to the end. So let me give you three more reasons why our mission is a compassion mission. Can I do that very quickly? I want to give you three more reasons why our mission is a compassion mission. Last week I gave you a reason. I gave you one reason last week and that reason was that hell is real. Hell is real. I know we don't hear about hell anymore when we come to church, but hell is real. And the Bible tells us that, that, that hell will burn not only with fire, but also with sulfur. How many of you remember that from last week? Sulfur is what makes a skunk scent smell the way it smells. And sulfur is part of the smell that you smell when you smell rotten eggs. Are you with me? So not only is hell going to burn with unquenchable fire, it's going to stink. And we read that the worm will not die in hell. So the worms, while they are being tormented with fire and smelling that stink and the burn in their nostrils, worms will be tormenting them. It's not something you wish on your worst enemy. So let me give you three more reasons why our mission is a compassion mission. Are you still in church? Oh. Number one. Three more reasons why our mission is a compassion mission. Number one, it is a compassion mix mission because it requires love mixed with action. Jesus was moved to action to heal the sick and feed them even with physical food. It requires what? Love mixed with action. Turn your Bible with me to Jude. Jude, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude, verses 21 to 23. There's only one chapter in Jude. Now, I want everybody here. 
I want you here. I want you here. I want you here. Do your best to focus. Do your best to be here. Amen? Do your best. Jude, verses 21 to 23. It reads from the King James. Keep yourselves in what? Keep yourselves in what? In what? The love of God. So you trying to get me off in attitude? You trying to get me off in anger? You trying to get me pissed off? No, I'm going to keep myself in the love of God. Amen? Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. And listen to this. Of some have compassion, making a difference. Do you see this? He's given us some advice. First of all, you got to keep yourself in the love of God. That's why it begins at home. Then, on some, have compassion. And the compassion ought to move you to do what? Make a difference in their life. Make a difference in somebody's life. Did you hear me? The compassion ought to move you to do what? Make a difference in somebody's life. Now, look at what he says. Some have compassion making a difference. Verse 23, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment, garment spotted by the flesh. What is he trying to tell us? Can we talk about this for a minute? He said, on some, have compassion, making a difference. And then he said, some, pluck them out of the fire. When you are winning souls, when you are doing evangelism, when you are witnessing, there are some people that what they need at that moment is to hear that God loves them. And that God has a plan for them. And God has not forgotten them. Other people, plug them out of the fire. Other people, they need to be confronted in their sin. There's some people when you go witness to them and you talk to them on the street, I'm, I, you know, I go to church. I'm, I'm straight. I go to church. I ask you, did you go to church? I ask you, are you born again? Some people, you got to confront them in their foolishness. Other people, they just, they just need somebody to tell them that God loves them. They just need somebody to do what? To tell them that God loves them. Last, what, what, I don't know if it was last Sunday. Was it last Sunday we went for evangelism? Last Sunday when we went out, I took Sunita and Marigold with me. And there was a young girl I started talking to in front of the grocery store, the Weiss grocery store at our beauty shopping center. And uh, I just went up to her. I started talking to her. I said, hi. Uh, you know, we're, we're new in the community. We're trying to get to know the community. Our church is down off Saint, uh, by St. Agnes. Can I talk to you? I, I just want to know, is there anything I can pray for you about? She said, oh, white, our white sister, Caucasian sister, she said, yeah. I said, good, I'm going to pray for you. Uh, what are the churches like in this area? She said, I grew up in this area all my life. She said, I used to go to so-and-so church, which was right around the corner from the Weiss grocery store. And she said, but to be honest with you, I ain't been to church in years. I ain't going to even try to fake with you. I, I grew up in church. Church was a part of my life. You know, I received the Lord in church, but I ain't been to church in years. I, <laughs> I, said, I said, that's okay. That's all right. I just want to encourage you. What's going on? That woman opened up. She told me private things. I mean, standing in front of the grocery store, she ain't never met me before. She ain't, she ain't never met me from nowhere. She just started pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. Listen, some people just need some compassion. Some people just need somebody to stop them and say, you know what? You look like you're having a bad day. Can I pray for you? You look like depressed. You look like them kids getting on your nerves. I've been there. Can I pray for you? Sometimes that's all you need to do. Do you know Jesus? 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 Do you know? Ain't nobody want that. You don't want that. You don't want that. You don't want nobody coming at you like that. Have a conversation. Show some compassion. Show some. Just start a conversation. Then you get to that. Hmm. And by the time I prayed for her and she started talking to me, I could have. Anything I wanted to ask her, I could ask her. Do you understand? Because she felt some compassion. She felt some compassion. And truly, I had compassion for her. When I saw her, I said, I need to go talk to that lady. Something is not right. Do you understand what I'm saying? So some people, all they need is you to show them some compassion. Other people, confront them. Pluck them out of the fire. Deal with them. 
Because you can see that if somebody don't tell them, they're on their way. They're on their way. So, number one, our commission is a compassion mission because it requires love and action. Love mixed with action. Love mixed with what? Action. Number two, our com commission is a compassion mission because God expects us to demonstrate compassion to humanity. And there are co consequences. Listen to this. God expects us to demonstrate compassion to humanity. And there are consequences when we don't do it. There are consequences when we don't do it. And that's why I said last Sunday that most believers, I'm not talking about just, just this church, I'm talking about the body of Christ. That's why I said last Sunday, most believers live in a perpetual state of disobedience. Most believers. I know you don't want to hear it. I know you are arguing with me in your mind. I know right now you're like, <laughs> I ain't disobedient. No, not me. Okay. Okay. Can we, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's look in the Word. Can we do that? Let's look in the Word. Matthew chapter 25 from verse number 31. And I want to read from the NIV. Matthew chapter 25 from verse number 1. Number 2, God expects us to demonstrate compassion to humanity and there are consequences when we don't do it. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, from the NIV. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Remember now the disciples were asking, what's the sign of your return? This is a description of what it's going to be like when he returns. When he returns, he's going to come in his glory, he's going to sit on his throne, and he's going to separate the people. Are you with me so far? Verse 33, he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. So, so, there's an inheritance to be had. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry. Listen to this. How did they get their inheritance? This is how they got it in verse 35. For I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Jesus, you, you was hungry? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Verse 38, when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? Jesus, you was in prison? When did we see you uh, 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 sick or in prison and go to visit you? Verse 40, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Now, that's good, but let's look at the flip side. Those are the people that were on his right hand. Are you still with me? Those are the people that was on his right hand. Can we contrast that? Let's see. Do you want to know what happened to the people on the left? To the left? To the left? To the, you want to know? Let's see. Let's find out. Okay. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared. Not for you. It wasn't prepared for you. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply. He will have an answer. He will reply. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment. Do you see why we need a food bank? Do you see why we need to rally around the food bank? He said that if you don't feed them, you're not feeding me. If you don't feed them, you're not feeding me. And guess what? If you don't feed them, eternal punishment. 
is your portion. Did it, is that what the scripture said? So our commission is a compassion mission. And it has consequences if we don't do it. There are consequences if we don't show compassion. Are you with me? Okay, I know some of you are like, okay, hurry up and finish. But I'm telling you, there are many believers who think they are Christians that are going to be surprised. They're going to be surprised. Because all they lived for was us for and no more. My breakthrough, my family, my children, my healing, my business. And God will look at you and say, I never knew you. I never knew you. You couldn't even give a bottle of water to a homeless person. And as much as you didn't do it to them, you didn't do it to me. You didn't feed me. You didn't give me nothing when I was thirsty. But you want to boast about your prophetic gift. You didn't give me nothing when I was hungry. But you want to try to impress the pastor. And guess what he would say? To the left. To the left, to the left, to the left, to the left. That's what he would say. Oh, some of y'all just got offended. In the last days, many will be offended. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I don't want you to be deceived. You see, I don't want you to stand in that great day and you think, you are okay. And he tell you to the left. And you are in a state of shock. I will not be a good pastor if I don't tell you. You see, but sometimes people who tell you the truth, they take all the hits. They take all the hits and they are misunderstood. And we get mad at the people who tell us the truth. We ought to be thankful. He said, as much as you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. You didn't do it to me. You want to carry the, and give the pastor a drink of water? You want to get, you want, you want make, you want to get the pastor, you want to fix the pastor a plate, and you want to bring the pastor a bottle of water? But you drive by the homeless person on the street sitting in the heat with no air conditioning, and you won't give them a bottle of water. Keep your bottle of water. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. So there are consequences. You see, this is why we got to get our food bank together. This is why we got to get our outreach together. This is why we need a prison ministry. He said, you didn't visit me in prison. So God expects us to have a prison ministry. Hello? It wasn't just somebody's great idea one day. It's in the Bible. Sick or in prison and you didn't visit me. You see, that's why part of the job of a deacon or a minister or elder is to visit people. We focus on the wrong thing. We focus on our breakthrough and all. Blah, 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 blah. And Jesus is saying, look, <laughs> this is what I'm concerned about. So number one, I said I'll give you three more reasons and I'm almost done. Our first reason was that hmm, it requires love and action. Our co-mission is a compassion mission because it requires what? Love and action. Number two, our co-mission is a compassion mission because God expects us to demonstrate compassion to humanity and there are consequences when we don't do so. The third reason is that our mission, listen to this, is a compassion mission because hell was never intended for people. Hell was never intended for people. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. I'm closing because I see that we are at our limit. But I want us to understand that the church is called to show compassion. And the church is called to win the loss. If people don't come to the point where they repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and confess that belief, they are going to hell. 
Hell is real. Church is not a good idea. Church is not just a good idea. You see, and our society has us thinking all kinds of things. Church is not just a good idea. It is about the lives of people. Eternity. It's about eternity. Look at somebody say it's about eternity. I want to invite you to respond to the word this morning. Perhaps there was someone you saw in public and God prompted you to talk to him, but you didn't. Maybe you walked by like the priest and the Levite, the pastor and the praise and worship leader. Maybe you walked by like somebody on the videos that we watched this morning. I want you to respond to the word and I want you to ask God to forgive you and give you compassion. Maybe, you, 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 maybe now you see the importance of feeding the hungry with our food bank and you want to commit to help us. Maybe you realize that your love or your compassion for the loss has waxed cold. I want you to respond to the word and ask God to help you to make change. Change that needs to be made to walk in compassion. Stand in your feet, please. This is what God has given us to give to you this morning. We must walk in compassion. We must endeavor to feed the hungry. We must endeavor to give something to drink to those that are thirsty. We must endeavor to visit those in prison. We must endeavor to visit those who are sick. We must endeavor to share the love of God with somebody. Somebody is in need of some compassion. Others need to be plucked out. But Jesus said, if you don't do it for the least of these, you didn't do it to me. And so I need us to respond to the word this morning. I want you to just lift your hands and begin to talk to the Father. Maybe you saw somebody, you were prompted to speak to them and you didn't, you walked away. Begin to talk to the Father and ask him that your compassion will not wax cold. That God will give you a desire, a burning desire, a burning passion, burning compassion for the lost, a compassion that will move us to action. Begin to talk to the Father. Ask him to help you to make any change that is necessary. Begin to talk to the Father. Begin to talk to the Father. Begin to talk to the Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we bless you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, this morning we come and we ask you, work in us compassion. Take away any hardness of heart, any place where our love has waxed cold. Father, let the fire of your compassion and your love, let it burn in us. Let your love compel us to action. Let your word move us to action to demonstrate the compassion of Christ to humanity. Help us, Father, to do something to help somebody. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we pray, Father, for the kind of compassion that drove Jesus to heal the sick, to preach the gospel. Oh, because he was moved with compassion, he shared the gospel with people. Father, let that kind of compassion be stirred in us uh, that we will be compelled and moved to share share the gospel at the grocery store, at the gas station, on, on our jobs, and the schools. Father, help us to be moved with compassion to share the gospel. Help us to be moved with compassion to heal the sick. Help us to be moved with compassion to cast out devils. Help us to be moved with compassion, Father, to help the homeless, feed the hungry, give to them that are thirsty, visit those in prison. Help us, oh God, to have compassion to do it to the least of these where we are cold, where we lack compassion. Help us, oh God. Holy Ghost, we need you uh, to flow uh, and to move uh, in compassion. Father, we need your spirit for it is not by our own might. Uh, it is not by our own power, but it is by your spirit. Father, let your spirit move in us. Uh, in the name of Jesus, somebody begin to lift up your voice and begin to pray. Somebody begin to lift up your voice and begin to pray. 
pray. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, I want you to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. If not pray in your understanding, pray in your understanding for compassion. Holy Ghost, remove in the hardness of heart. Lord, help us. Oh, help us to put feet to this message. Help us that this word will bear fruit in our life, fruit that will remain in the name of Jesus. That it will not be empty words, that it will not be nice words, but Holy Ghost, help us to move with compassion. In the name of Jesus. Right now, I want to invite anybody who said, you know what? All this thing you are talking is nice, but I have never repented, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and confessed that belief. I've never publicly confessed that belief. And I need to give my life to Christ. I